Um, let's spend a little bit of time in prayer now, and particularly um, thinking about the coming year. And obviously, our, um, when you think about the new year, it's all about um, a lot of it's thinking about the uh, opportunity for renewal, but also about new year. Um, you know, the hope for things to change, and there's a lot of things in our world I'm sure we would all would, would all want to change and to um, for God's peace and God's uh, renewal to be involved. So let's pray about those things. God, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for the for 2023 and uh, everything that's happened during this, this year. And, um, and thank you for uh, bringing us together consistently that we can come and worship you consistently every week. Lord, as we go, look into the new year, we pray for our world and we pray for our, uh, our society and our community. And we pray that this world that desperately needs your peace and your love and your understanding will we'll get those things and we'll start understanding it more. Lord, we think about Ukraine and, and Israel um, and uh, those two trouble spots. We pray that you'll be um, working in those places to both bring peace to those nations but also to work in the, the micro sense of individuals and, and individual actions and, and um, uh, individual witnesses of your, of your grace so that uh, the people there will be blessed even if the war is continuing. Um, we pray that um, uh, you'll give our governments wisdom and governments across the world wisdom in knowing how to deal with those trouble spots and how to resolve them for the, for the good of everyone involved. Lord, we pray for our, our nation. Um, again, our nation desperately needs you, and we pray that you will be guiding our leaders in this coming year. You'll be guiding uh, Anthony Albanese. You'll be guiding Chris Mins. You'll be guiding uh, all the other leaders. They'll be um, looking to you and seeking your God, your wisdom, and your, uh, your truth in everything they do. We pray for our community and us as a church, and we've just heard about the importance of gathering, gathering together as a church. We pray that you'll be helping us to um, to be an effective community um, here in this in Cessnock, that we'll be supporting and loving each other and that people around us will see that we are a community they want to be part of. And, uh, yeah, that through that our witness and our, uh, our love for each other might be seen and might be a, a witness of you. And, Lord, we pray for our families as well. Um, for each one of us who's got a family and... and um, you know, a bunch of relationships and a lot of those are blessings at some stages and challenging at others. And we pray that you'll be giving us grace and wisdom to be able to deal with our families in this coming year, to be able to to be uh, working effectively so that they might always be a place of um, refuge and a place of support and a place of blessing for each one of us. And uh, we pray that for the difficult things in our families that you'll be giving us wisdom to know how to, how to address them um, and how to... Um, to yeah, turn turn places of difficulty to places of peace. Peace. We pray also for our families and our friends and those who don't know you. And through the coming year, that we'll be inspired and given opportunities to talk to them about you. That you might help us to take those opportunities gracefully and and sensitively, and help them to know you as well. Because we know that's where the greatest peace is. And that the more people who find peace at the at the personal level impacts our community, impacts our nation, and impacts the world. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're reading 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to God's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Well, isn't it wonderful to be able to sit around on the last day of the year and not be baking in the sun and wishing you were at the beach? <laughs> yeah. The um, calendar has been a bit different this year, hasn't it? Anyone remember when the first was? 
the first day of this year, the first of January, a Sunday, a Sunday. I won't ask you who preached. <laughs> and uh, today, the last day of the year, is a Sunday. That's an interesting arrangement. I didn't have to go and pack, pull out all the old calendars in the house to see when it last happened or when it will next happen. Mr Google tells me that the last year was 2017. But unfortunately, it won't occur again until 2034. So it's an interesting cycle. And uh, at the beginning of the year, I talked about the day of the Lord and the winding up of the earth and the, re and the renewal, a new creation in which we will have a place as well. Isn't it marvellous? People wonder where the world's going and we can tell them straight from Scripture. And when they say, well, how do you know that? You can say, well, Jesus Christ died back then, didn't he? Everyone knows that. Even our friends in other countries and other religions can point to that. In fact, they could probably point to it better than some of us because they study it as equally with their own. But today we're looking at a very important time for Christians. We're looking at a marvellous time for Christians. And it comes, and I've selected out because we've already looked at Revelation during our normal Sunday service this year, but I've selected out Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, and particularly these verses from 13 to 18 of chapter 4. Paul was in his second missionary journey. He crossed the Aegean from Asia, coming back from Turkey to Greece, and arrived in the northern areas of what we call Greece, and he travels south to Thessalonica. Paul's stay in Thessalonica was not as long as he wasn't greeted quite in the way that he'd been greeted in Asia. He was in a spot where he preached, he went and saw the Jews, which is his normal way of working, talked to them about what had happened, and why he was there, and then he started preaching and he assembled a group of believers out of the Jewish element there, but also out of the Greek and the slave element that would be part of that culture, who had come and joined him and had surrendered their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was shortened, his stay there was shortened because of growing disputes between the Jews, the Greeks, the Christians, the slaves. Uh, but the church had been established. It progressed despite this opposition from the Greeks and the Jews. Uh, and eventually Paul and Silas decided it was time to leave, so they moved south and eventually ended up in Athens. And he's writing back to them. This letter goes back to them to confirm all the things that he had taught them because there was an ongoing church alive and well and practising in an area that had never known anything else but heathen gods and structures and ceremony. Paul doesn't pull any punches in his spirit-inspired words to the Thessalonians. 
He reminds them that the world is populated of two kinds of people, those who have hope and those who don't, those who know the Lord Jesus Christ and those that have ignored him. He says in the verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. He's not just talking about any old hope, but the hope both bought and brought about by the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. It was brought in a specific time in world history during the occupation by the Romans of the Jewish nation, and it was bought at a tremendous cost to God in sending his son Jesus to only have him rejected by his own people who tried him and crucified him, not just for the Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. Past, present, future. And this was quite a different idea than worshipping something that is stone or a thought. But his submission to his father's will delivered much more in that it created a way for people to be reconciled to God. The carrot or reward of eternal life through believing in Jesus was so vast a change of thinking for the Greeks who submitted to the worship of many deities in the hope that one of them would bring them successful life, but perhaps nothing after. Most have something after, but the Greek ones was, well, that's it, life's over. Many Jews and Greeks, as well as other nationalities, received the Lord and became Christians because no other deity had risen from the dead. Oh, what a difference. Some superstitious superstitions like that of Icarus flying towards the sun until his feathers dropped off because the wax wouldn't hold them any longer, and he plummeted to his death into the sea. It's a world of imagination. There's no depth to it. There's no reality to it. There's no future to it. The Thessalonians had been in a church long enough to witness the physical death of some of their members, and they began to question what happens to those they have buried. When is the Lord coming that you tell us about? And so this epistle goes back to them so that they might know and be reassured. In many today still disregard God and Jesus, because they cannot see in their mind tangible evidence of them. Therefore, they treat them as fantasies. Media, popular culture, focus on entertainment, continue to write out or rework traditional thought and pass down norms as being out of touch. And if you look and think about the times that you see, oh, that sounds very Christian, but then the next part of the statement isn't. They take what is because they're in the media game and they twist it for the new game, the new game of deception, the new game of sucking people in, the new game of diverting their attention from a holy and loving God who looks to all people 
to be drawn towards him. So as this is occurring today, it's no real surprise to us to read that the Thessalonians were also questioning their beliefs and looking for the next step that had been spoken about. The short time span of human concentration develops distracting and self-satisfying pursuits that enable people to step around God and they effectively sideline his invitation to eternal life. They can ignore it because they're so busy. But unsurprisingly, God doesn't work in our time frames to our expectations. Our expectations are often trifling, ill-conceived and quite laughable. God is not bound by earthly time frames like the calendar or expectations that he did not send to Jesus to earth on a trivial whim. He planned it. He understood what was needed and he was prepared to take the second member of the Godhead and give him a task on earth in human being form. Isn't that marvellous that God has done for us? It's important, it was important to God to provide a path that reconciled the cost of sin, death, so that people could pass from death to life and nothing else can do that. You can't take three once a day and hope to recover. You take God once and live for him. God longs for people to recognize us the way to recognize the way to eternal life through repentance and acceptance of the greatest present given to the people of this world by the death and resurrection of his son Jesus. And when you think about it, God demonstrated that sort of thing often. And one thought is he demonstrated through Noah. He took a family that was God-fearing, he wiped out all the people on earth and yet that family continued and developed in sin because it was part of their DNA. What had happened in Eden follows through and it doesn't matter if you wipe out everyone else and just take one little group out who were following you, they still can't trash the sin. Only God can. Jesus, through the disciple John, who recorded the Lord's word, should have been a guarantee enough for the Thessalonians. But obviously... The pressure of nonconformity played on the members of the new church. The pressure of living in a community. And the information was fairly sparse at that time. Many of the texts that we read when we pick up our phone or pick up a Bible, were, in the New Testament, many of the texts were just fragments. They were what had been written. And sometimes a letter was a, a continuing letter. You wrote the first part and it went, then you wrote the next bit and it went, and so on. And for instance, John's letter, the Gospel of John, uh, the Gospel of John was not completed until about the year 90. And this is after when Paul had been in, uh, been in Thessalonia. The earliest parts of John are fragments around about the year 70. And these fragments were then brought together by people, scholars, and created into the whole of John because it was authored by the same person but, and then brought together. So Paul couldn't say, go and look at John. We have that advantage. We can go and look at John. And uh, that oral tradition that had been built in the early church 
didn't couldn't point to chapter and verse because chapters and verses didn't come in until it was in the monasteries and the monastic people creating Bibles decided they needed a better way to keep them accurate and so they split them up into what we have today. It was really an oral tradition of the early church and uh, they uh, couldn't understand couldn't explore the New Testament at that time because it didn't exist. It hadn't been pulled together. It was just fragments. So today we can open up John and see what could have been said to them. John 14 uh, and uh, verses 2 and 3. John 14 says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That would have been great comfort to those people who were understanding why the, we're still burying them when we've got everlasting life. How does that work? If the Thessalonians can be wondering when Jesus would return in a few short years, it is testimony to God's patience that he is waiting for a time that only he knows when Jesus will return to gather the church and to present them to his father. That will be job done, Dad, quite very respectfully. After times of revival, both within the Jewish tradition and the creation of a kingdom, there were many crooked kings resulting in the nation's eventual cycle of downfall and rebuilding and the eventual dispersion by a series of conquerors following their rejection of Jesus. They were booted out around the year 100, out and spread out throughout the empires. But throughout the dark ages and into modern times, God continued to build a people for himself in the church. He commenced in selecting groups of apostles who went to establish town churches in Asia, which is Turkey, India and Europe, and uh, even, sorry, and in India with Thomas and uh, Europe, as we see here in Paul's dealings with the Thessalonians who responded to questions as pertinent today as then. When will Jesus come again? And just as an aside, the Jewish estate in effect ceased to exist after the first century until the bringing together of Israel commenced in the late 1800s to gather strength in the 1920s through the kibbutz era and was recognised after World War II in 1948 as a nation, but a secular nation, not a religious society. And that is still, uh, at, is still at in God's good time. So it's significant that the return of Jesus to the air that was made by Paul to, in today's reading is a question that should engage today's people with some degree of urgency. With some degree of urgency. Indeed, as Luke in Acts chapter 1 records the discussion with Jesus some 40 days after resurrection, because he had risen, they were ready to pursue the kingdom of a restored Jerusalem. But that was not the Lord's intent at that time. It wasn't part of God's plan. They gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus states, the times and dates are set by my Father. Even the Son is not privileged to know. He said, 
to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority. In verse 8, the promise of the Holy Spirit empowering them to be witnesses and note that it was not just to the Jewish nation, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So John, uh, the Mark writing, I'll get it right, yeah, Luke writing Acts, um, is giving stuff away to us that was probably not available at the time. In um, verse 9, we see that after he had said this, he was taken up from their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And it's important for us to remember as we look through this, in verse 10, they were so transfixed that they did not see the arrival of two men dressed in white. And then comes those marvellous words questioning what they were doing. Why do you lot stand here looking into the sky? Jesus had gone. He'd been gone and he moved into a cloud. I often think that's one of the best bits of theatre I've ever seen because that cloud hid the glory of God on the other side or it hid a disappearance because he didn't need the body any longer. White light, black light, the whole lot working together so you could not see him. But the cloud was there. Why stand you looking at the sky? And then reassuring them uh, with those words in verse 11, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken for you into heaven will come back in the same way as you see him go in he into heaven. Now, that's far greater than what the Jewish uh, prophets and the trainee prophets saw when uh, the, the, the transfer of power from Elisha to Elijah. Remember, people going into heaven had happened before. Elisha was picked up by what? appeared to be a chariot and taken up to heaven. He threw out his cloak and that became evidence for Elijah to become the senior prophet in the country at the time. So there is a precedence way back there, and a precedence through the Lord Jesus Christ that he'll come again and receive his people to be with him. The Lord returns in a similar way. While that was a going, there is a returning. And what goes up, thank the Lord, comes down. And uh, there is a returning because the Lord returns to the air for the church. And then later on, I believe, he comes to the earth to reign. And there is a bit of time frame in there where God deals with the church and that came out during Revelation, I guess, in the last uh, month. The return of the Lord is, and not the earth, is significant because it will signify the end of the church age. It will signify the end of the church age as we know it. And if we look at Timothy 4.14, says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Hallelujah. And so we believe that God will bring with him Jesus 
will, will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, that's interesting because when you read the next verse, we won't straight away, but when you read the rest, next verse, there seems to be a bit of confusion. And partly the thought is this, that there have been many lives lost, like Stephen's the first, who was lost because he became a martyr. And it appears, I would think, that the brew that he brings back with him will be the martyrs that have been taken up into the kingdom of God, into the bosom of the Lord and brought back at this time. Because when we go on uh, to the next slide, Verse 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The dead in Christ, those that have left in the world but dead, they will rise first. Here we see the order of things. The dead will rise first, and that's similar to the experience in Jerusalem following the Lord's resurrection. Remember Matthew 27 and 53? They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. There's a precedence for it. God's recorded it for us to have, be, to have the confidence to say that the dead in Christ will rise They'll join those that were martyrs that have come back. And then after that, we who are still alive and left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see, this is not the end of the earth. As the resurrected dead and those living believers at the time unite with Christ in the air, in the same way as Jesus left to take up, take up into the cloud, they do it again. They rise like the Lord did from the earth to the heavens to be with God. Well, what's the result of this meeting? The result is so we will be with the Lord forever. What a wonderful provision that has been made for those who believe God's word, have accepted Jesus as their saviour. Don't be like some who stick around for a while and then drop off. Probably never made a real decision in the first place. Church is not so much about seat warming, but refreshing our minds to direct our paths in the way of righteousness. There's a purpose of group conformity, of believing similar things, believing one way and moving forward as a group. In Proverbs 8 and 20, the character wisdom says... I walk in the way of righteousness along paths of justice. And boy, if people ever needed a way to live today, it's what wisdom says. It's a great banner and confidence. Now these days, the thought for many is unfamiliar in our modern age which views everything as potentially permissible, blurring right and wrong, providing many excuses. It suits me. It felt right. Everybody does it, etc. It's important to look forward to the future just as we look backwards to creation, Calvary, resurrection and indeed glimpses of heaven. Keep our mind, keep our eyes focused on the end point, the end game, and pursue it 
we develop a thirst for where we are going, looking forward, understanding that the future has already been revealed in Scripture for us. Don't have to make it up. And we see, as we've already said quite a number of times over the last month, God wins. So, folks, look forward to your new year and your continuing journey through this world with the great hope that is God-given and ever-present in your hearts and minds, guiding your footsteps throughout 2024. God bless and keep you.